And now we're coming to medical robotics, overcoming the translational barriers by Professor Guangxiang Yang. Uh, Professor Yang is the director and co-founder of the Hamlin Center for Robotic Surgery and deputy chairman of the Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College, where he holds a number of key academic positions. Uh, Guangxiang is a fellow of this academy and his main research interests are in medical imaging, sensing and robotics. He's internationally recognized for his innovations in clinical application of magnetic resonance imaging and flow quantification and pioneering effort in perpetual docking for robotic control and body sensor network. So please give a very warm welcome to Professor Yang. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. So what I'm going to do is really to share with you some of the barriers in terms of translating robotic technology for clinical use. So when we talk about the robotics, we're all familiar with this sort of things, and this in fact that's the, some of the latest development in robotics that showcased in Germany last, uh, last month in fact that, uh, in ICRA, which is the main conference in robotics, including medical robotics. So it's a real use in terms of clinical environment that, uh, for rehabilitation and also for surgery. This is something that uh, we try to push on in terms of the handling center in developing a technology that is not only advanced from the engineering point of view, but also from clinical perspective, is actually to do something that is otherwise not able to do by surgeons using their bare hands. So I'm going to talk about in the context of minimally invasive surgery. As you know, minimally invasive surgery, the very nature of that is that you use keyhole to provide the access and use instruments to provide minimally invasive and also that uh, minimally collateral damage to the tissue. So the key thing here is access. The key thing here is minimal trauma and also to improve the quality of life after surgery and therefore, these are the key things that we try to focus on. In fact, minimally invasive surgery that uh, has a long history, and back in 1585, that very word choker has been pioneered, and this is really the port that you use to insert instruments. Then from then, a number of different things have been developed, including robots itself. In fact, that, uh, that in 2007, that the very you know, first notes procedure that in fact you are not introducing incisions on the, on the tissue, but you, you actually can access that through natural orifices. And also, of course, that we are all probably heard about from the news about the, uh, you know, Da Fengqi robot and so on, and these are really the, some of the latest development. So all looks very exciting from the engineering point of view, but what about the clinical uptake and also its commercial impact? Now, if we look at the very early years of medical robotics, and these are some of the growth curves from 2003 and 2005. And this is really the very peak growth area that our period for robotic surgery. And as you can see, in certain sectors, such as urology, it has enjoyed very rapid growth. But for certain areas where you really need a robot, for instance, that for cardiac surgery, beating heart surgery in particular, this is in fact an area hasn't enjoyed too many success you know, too, many, uh, too much success. Why is that? Well, the issues are here is that the current robotic technology, it is very much developed for engineering looking for a solution. In fact, that, uh, the very first robot was developed for cardiac surgery, but its dexterity and also its function doesn't suit for that. And therefore, the urologist and actually found a good use of it. And this in the inventor's word that uh, in Lowney Smith for intuitive surgery, what he says, as an engineer, that, you know, as, a, as a businessman, we develop a technology, we aimed at the heart, but we managed to hit the prostate. We're still making money, but in the next phase of development, perhaps we are not going to be so lucky. So let's look at what are the developments in the last 
20 years or two, three decades in terms of robots. In 1993, this is the very first robot ESOP that been FDA approved. And since then, that the Zeus robot, which uses the exoskeletal system to provide you with the stereo vision and also manipulation of the dexterous instruments, allow you to perform remotely, that uh, away from the patient. For battlefield, for remote operation, this is very attractive. But in theaters, of course, it also plays a role because it means the surgeons can sit in the unsterile environment and also that allow multiple surgeons that to collaborate together. This is, of course, that uh, the uh, you know, very much uh, publicity uh, uh, pictures in the real theater environment. This, in fact, it may look like this. So here, what you see is an overwhelming engineering infrastructure that uh, empowering the operating table. In fact, in this particular slide, you can't even see the patient. What you really want, perhaps, is really to bring the surgeons back to the patient and also that to allow the surgeon to perform operations that as, you know, using his normal practice, but only for certain segments, for certain areas that uh, he may not be able to do, use his bare hands, use his na naked eyes, to actually use the robot to help. So this brings down what is the real purpose of developing robots. Of course, from engineering, from technology, we need to do that. But in terms of clinical and also economic impact, perhaps we need to think differently. And first of all, how can we provide see-through vision to superhuman vision so that you can see beyond the exposed tissue surface? You'll be able to use augmented reality, for instance, that to navigate inside the you know, uh, uh, anatomy, be able to see be able to co-register preoperative, intraoperative data, and also be able to define anatomical structures as well as tissue characterization, for instance, to forgo the need of you know, histopathology and those type of things. <coughs> Currently, these are the things that are complicating the surgical workflow, perhaps in future, that we can actually get this all seamlessly integrated. So vision is number one, very much built on the success of imaging. How about other areas, mechatronics? Well, if we look at all the development of all the uh, medical robotic uh, technology, that in fact, there are many, many platforms. Many of the platforms are still limited in the um, research community that didn't manage to go uh, get across the valley of, uh, valley of death. And many of the systems managed to get that, but then didn't survive the initial you know, hostile environment in the commercial world. In fact, that if you look at those platforms, a lot of the platforms actually are already starting to push for technology that is low cost, that is accessible, that is, can be used for specific surgical tasks that are really required by the surgeon. Let me take one example that uh, the development at Imperial College, this is very much the work by Professor Brian Davis showing on the right, that's the Aquabot. And demonstrate that you know, from academic development, from a concept to a prototype, uh, to a complete system that can be used in the clinical environment. Now the company is being joined force with Mako, and this is very much a key player in the orthopedic robot area. So making the robot to be more compact, to be more, affo more affordable, and also satisfy a specific purpose clinically, this certainly will drive the commercial uptake of the technology itself. Now you may ask, in terms of robots, what is the current development? Where does the future lie? And also, how do we see its development in terms of influence to UK academic research as well as UK industry? Let me use this analogy that to help you to guide the development for the next two, three decades. So we all know the development and also history of digital computer. You may have seen this in the Science Museum, and you may have seen this in UPAN, and also that uh, some of the mainframes that you have seen before. Now, if you want to say that where the robotic technology, particularly surgical robot, is, then this is very much similar to in the early 80s where the computer technology is. So we still have big systems. Small systems start to emerge, but they are embodied in such form. And if Apple managed to remain as this, perhaps none of you will use it. And through its, through its evolution, and it has actually gone through many, many different iterations. 
and some of you have used some of those devices, but all in all, as you can see, it's a relentless, relentless uh, you know, pursuit in terms of not only technological development, but also interface design and all these other issues, of course, that to the marketing and so on. But if you look at the surgical technology, in fact, the devices hasn't been changed dramatically in the past 100 years. And what you see, those pictures on the left, are not dissimilar to those ones we use today. Now, if you ask what is the real success of systems such as Da Fengqi robot, there are two areas that uh, deserves that uh, you know uh, uh, deserves my comment. One is really the vision I talked about early on, and the second one is this what we call the end wrist. This really brings down to this dexterous movement that you'll be able to simulate the human hands and therefore to bring all this thing back. So perhaps the future is towards miniaturization, dexterity, and also incorporating sensing and imaging so that you'll be able to provide superhuman capabilities for those robots. And this, in fact, perhaps makes sense. Now, in the academic community, we're already pursuing this. For instance, that uh, the handheld system developed by colleagues in the U.S., these kind of mainland universities, and that, uh, these are all very much, uh, you know, handheld system. That the one need to uh, install something here. That uh, um, this will be able to sense the environment, but also react to the tissue. So in this case, that it will stop automatically just by using a very simple, you know, uh, uh, contact sensing. And the other is that be able to provide this robot to be localized or co-registered with local environment, rather than inventing a complicated system that clinically is difficult to do. So mount onto the moving frame reference, be able to perform microsurgery. This is the steady hand that to perform retinal surgery in Johns Hopkins University. The micron small robot that can be used for retinal surgery as well, developed by Carnegie Mellon University. So if you look at the evolution of robotic technology or surgical technology, and this is very much as you can see here, is where everything that uh, will move towards in terms of militarization and also that uh, in, in terms of improving dexterity and also superhuman capabilities, in quotes, that to help with the operation itself. Now, if you look at how the technology will merge, evolve in future, the next thing is really whether it's possible to incorporate cellular level imaging and into this in situ in vivo environment. Downstairs, you will see several examples from uh, the Hamlin Center in terms of uh, biophotonics probes we have developed over the years. And the why do we need that? Is really it provides the tissue characterization. Characterization allows you to see normal, hyperplasia, and also adenoma, adenocarcinoma. And this is a commercial system developed by a French company that uh, called Monarchia, but we can actually miniaturize this to you know, um, uh, the many factors that to be able to provide a similar function. I would like to qualify what Lionel was saying early on, the frugal technology, and perhaps to qualify it using the word accessible technologies. So by having those probes, very small, be able to provide in situ in vivo tissue characterization, and this is something that where you need a robot. Because in this case, when you have a pixel resolution of few microns, and the human hand can no longer control this. So in terms of the, uh, in terms of the uh, development and the evolution, you all heard about Moore's law in digital computers. Perhaps you are less familiar with Bell's law. What it says is that a new computing class will emerge every decade, and there will be new applications and also that uh, develop around these new classes. So these are the development paths that uh, for the digital computers in terms of the mainframe showing as blue, and you see the PC market that is uh, showing as pink, and the green one is the mobile devices, those devices you use in your pocket. And for medical robots, perhaps a similar kind of development will also, uh, will also be, uh, uh, you know, emerge in the next few years. You see currently those big robots in future, you will see those smaller, smarter instruments incorporating imaging sensing, be able to perform the superhuman capabilities and allow the surgical procedures to perform in the normal, you know, normal surgical uh, environment and really bring the surgeon back to the patient. So this is really the journey that we try to pursue in the Hamlin Center as well as other centers around the world. And I think that if we can capture this opportunity, perhaps that for the UK we can establish a niche 
a niche that will allow us to link all this, uh, you know, uh, advance in engineering and also clinical development and to bring this new class of devices that will not only scientifically, engineering-wise advanced, but also commercially, clinically make sense. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Even though we're running slightly behind, I'll allow one question at this stage because Professor Yang will be returning to the panel uh, in not so many minutes from now. So, yes, sir. Um, there's a huge amount of software on all the devices. Software that displays information is okay. Software that's got a sharp scalpel on the end. How do you get that past the regulators? Well, I mean that uh, you know, uh, a robot is uh, is not a new example. That uh, definitely itself that uh, is an uh, integration of software, hardware that uh, also that uh, with the various surgical instruments. I think here is that uh, that in fact that for regulatory approval, that the uh, the FDA and so on they don't have a fixed you know uh, a route for that. But fortunately, that uh, FDA all this kind of approval is ba based on prior examples. So there is a precedence being set. And therefore, that we have, you know, if we classify robots as medical devices, that is a well-defined set of procedures go, go through it. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Yang. I think you've done a wonderful job thank you. in presenting modern robotics and surgery. Thank you. Very much.